Hey, freelancers. Welcome back to Raising the Bar. Where we talk about the tips, the tricks, and the secrets to really take control over your business. I'm Matthew Matola, author of The Human Cloud, CEO of Venturel. My whole life has been freelancing, whether starting a freelance business, leading freelance teams, or helping companies spend up to $100 million on us. Today, we're going to talk about where your clients actually hang out, meaning where are they going to find you? This can be a pretty hot, hot button issue. And the reason is there's a lot of stuff out there telling you you have to do A, B, or C. In reality, it's a lot more nuanced. So let's get into understanding the secrets of where your clients are really hanging out. All right, so where, where are your clients hanging out? And the reason we really care is because how are they going to find you? Well, before we kind of tell you, well, before I tell you where they are, let me just, let's shatter some quick myths. The first myth is that we don't want a new client every single day, right? We ideally want to have 15 solid clients that are always consistently turning to us. The second myth, which this one might rub some people the wrong way, but you don't need to be a thought leader necessarily. I know there's a lot of buzz out there about you have to post on LinkedIn every day. You have to have a personal brand. Actually, a lot of the best freelancers that I've worked with, they don't even have a, a good public facing profile, which a lot of times when I recommend them, the person would be like, but they're LinkedIn. They only have like 45 friends. I'm like, I know, I know, trust me. But so with that said, let's now break into the secrets of where are they and how are they going to find you? So there's sort of three key insights or three places that they're going to find you. The first is existing clients. The second is your fellow freelancers. And the third, you can call it Google. So in terms of existing clients, the number one way that I would see freelancers getting hired, especially in large companies, was that a fellow employee or a colleague would be presenting a deck or showing off a landing page or something of that matter. And one of their colleagues would say, Janice, there's no way in the world that you did that. And Janice would obviously laugh and say, well, of course, I got a freelancer. And then that was the number one way they would say, oh, no way. Or the second way would be that when someone did need something, they would walk down the hall and ask everyone that they knew, do you know a freelance writer? Do you know a freelance designer, et cetera. The second way though, is existing freelancers. So the best freelancers out there, they don't have a demand problem. They actually are rejecting work left and right. And where you position yourself or what happens is that they need fellow freelancers who can take on the exact same work they do, meaning overflow, but then also complementary work. So right before this, I was in a coffee shop talking with a client and the client is starting a new company and this happens all the time. They need a pitch deck and a wireframe. They don't want to hire multiple freelancers. They want to have one point of contact, but they know that that one point of contact is also going to have several freelancers that are doing the work. So a lot of times what we like to, what we see is that generally a freelancer does 20 to 30% of the work and then subcontracts the rest out, meaning they own the strategy, but they know they can't do it all. So the second main point that clients find you is your existing freelancers. The third, the reason I call it Google is because there's multiple different platforms out there. There's Twitter, there's LinkedIn, there's freelance platforms. But generally what happens is you start with Google and Google indexes them all. So you say looking for freelance designer and FinTech or something of that matter and then the client finds you. So how can we take action on this most importantly? And of course we're gonna put it into three. Well, the first thing is just obviously under promising and over delivering your existing clients. And there's some little tips and tricks here. So the first thing actually is it's not necessarily the work you do, but it's how you make your client feel and how you go over and wow them. So a, a quick thing that actually as a freelancer or as a client, I love simple things like weekly status updates and having a template. Another thing though, is after the project upselling the crap out of me, in a indirect way. And what I mean by that is not a, hey, you can buy this, this, this. Instead, a, this was an awesome project. Have you thought about looking at, you know, A, B, C, meaning something to build off what we did. Another thing is actually making sure you have a portal for them. 
So a very frequent thing is a couple months after the engagement, a client will come back and say, you know, hey, Matt or hey, Ryan or whatever, do you have that file? And that's an opportunity for you to say, well, of course I do. Actually, here's your project portal. Here's everything we did. And by the way, here are some recommendations of what I said we should go to next time. So it's the first thing is under promising, over delivering and really having that wow experience. The second thing is going out and having a strong network of fellow freelancers. This doesn't mean having a huge LinkedIn. We usually like to say this means having 15 to fellow freelancers and about 20 to 30% of them that do the same exact thing that you do, but then others that are complementary. So if you're a writer, make sure you have designer friends and front-end developer friends and SEO friends and et cetera. Now, the third thing though, is being very clear about what you do. You can think about the, you can think about this as your value proposition, and I won't want to get too meta, but if you think about it, you are a node in this massive ecosystem called the internet, and you have a very, very hyper relevant skill set slash expertise. So you're not just a writer, but you have separate things that tag you. Perfect example, when we were writing the human cloud, we were looking for a writer and specifically one that mastered uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And so when you think about how hyper relevant the freelance economy is in terms of how clients are going to find you, it's more than just what we've been used to in a paper resume in terms of your skill. It's about the hyper relevant types of skills that you've done. So if we could summarize this all, the thing that's going to get me in a lot of trouble for saying this is that you don't need to be a LinkedIn or whatever thought leader posting every single day. Instead, you have to have very, very deep relationships with both your clients and freelancers and a deep relationship. One of the drivers is knowing yourself and making sure you quantify what's unique about you, specifically your hyper relevant skills, uh, the industries you've done them in and things like think about it as your Da Vinci. So to summarize again, well, two summaries, the three leading drivers of where your clients are going to find you is your existing clients, your existing freelancers, and then Google. And the three things that you can do right now is wowing the crap out of your existing clients, building your freelance network, and making yourself hyper, hyper relevant. Go on. Mm -hmm.